Well, we're going to spend one more night on trigonometry, and we're going to kind of hit two crazy things. We're going to, the first part of the video, we're going to dive into all of our identities, our reciprocal identities, quotient identities, Pythagorean identities, some of those rascals. And I, I look at those topics as maybe the topics that are going to be the difference between, you know, getting a 92 or versus a 96 on the exam. And of course, the 96 looks a little more attractive, and, and I think we'd all choose that. Um, and then the second half of the video will be focused on more, more trig graph stuff. Um, you know, can I look at a graph and then write an equation or if they give me an equation can I graph it that type of stuff and when I look at these graphs I think you know I think 90 percent of the time we're going to be working with just sine and cosine and so we're really going to spend a lot of time there you know sine starts right on the midline and then goes up cosine is going to start up off the midline and so forth um, of course you've got tangent that you can plug into your calculator and you've got these vertical asymptotes that you got to worry about and then we saw in class here recently that our calculator doesn't necessarily have a button for cosecant or secant or cotangent, but we can kind of manipulate it and say, okay, if you want to graph cotangent, just type in 1 divided by tangent. Or secant could be 1 divided by cosine, and then you'll get this graph. And the last comment I'll throw here before we get into our identities is, when you do graph these on your calculator, your best friend is going to be zoom trig. And that's going to set the window up so that you get the exact same graph as what we're seeing here. Okay, so which identities am I responsible for before I sit down for this exam? And, and first of all, so there's three different reciprocal identities. We know that uh, cosecant of theta is equal to 1 divided by sine of theta, and they could be substituted uh, interchangeably. Um, we know that secant of theta is equal to 1 divided by cosine of theta. And the third one here, we know that cotangent is equal to cosine, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm thinking of the quotient identity. Got to erase that rascal there. Okay. Um, is going to be 1 divided by tangent of theta. Okay. For the quotient identity, there's two that we've got to know. The first one says that uh, tangent of theta is equal to the sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. That's a handy one we'll use a lot this year as well as down the road in your future math classes. And then cotangent of theta could also be written as cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. Alright, um, Pythagorean identities. Um, the first one we call the godfather it, because he's so special here and so popular. Um, sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals 1. Now what you're going to see in class tomorrow is a whole bunch of manipulations of that equation where they're going to move t certain terms from one side to the other. So I could say, okay, sine squared of theta is equivalent to 1 minus cosine squared of theta just by subtracting cosine squared from both sides. Or um, what else could we do? We could go back to the original and say, okay, um, what if I subtracted a 1 from both sides and then subtracted cosine squared from both sides? You know, all sorts of crazy things where we're subtracting and adding terms from one side to the other and, and manipulating it. Um, now, the other two Pythagorean identities are going to come from, what if I divided each term by cosine squared, okay? Imagine that for a second. Um, sine squared divided by cosine squared would make tangent squared. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared would make 1, and 1 divided by cosine squared would make secant squared. And last but not least, I want you to imagine, what if I divided this term by sine squared, and this term by sine squared, and this term by sine squared? That would make 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. So those, that's a grand total of eight identities that we need to be comfortable with before we sit down for the exam. Okay, here's an example of an identity that we're going to try to verify. In other words, we're just, we're trying to prove through the formulas that we wrote down just a second ago that cotangent divided by cosine really does equal cosecant. So it's kind of cool. They're telling us what the answer is supposed to be. We're just going to kind of fill in the blanks and, and sh connect the dots from here to here. So when I see cotangent, I really have two options. I could use one divided by tangent, but historically I've had more success using cosine divided by sine. So I'm going to make that substitution for cotangent. We'll say cosine divided by sine. And then for this cosine of x, I'm just going to rewrite it as cosine of x over 1 to make it a fraction. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little keep change flip. So I'm going to keep the first fraction, change division to multiplication right here, and then flip the second fraction. So think of it as cosine of x divided by the sine of x multiplied by 1 over the cosine of x. And again, we're trying to prove that's equal to cosecant. What you can do algebraically here is cancel out these cosines. And let's kind of simplify or clean up what we've got here. We now have 1 divided by sine. So I could do 1 divided by sine. And that, indeed, is equal to cosecant. So we've proven that cosecant does equal cosecant, and this is what we call verifying the identity. All right, we're going to shift our focus into graphing here, and uh, they've given me an equation here, and we're going to try to graph this function over the domain from 0 to 2 pi. And the first thing, based on how much room it looks like I've got, I'm going to go, I'm going to count every two blocks and, and label these in terms of pi. So I've got pi over 2, I've got pi, uh, 3 pi over 2, and then 2 pi. And, um, and it looks like we've got a vertical shift up one unit, okay? And uh, so let's say there's up one. And we know that the sine curve starts right on that midline. So I'm going to start right here. I'm going to go up three units because of the amplitude. So we're going one, two, th I'm going to put that peak right there. We're going to come down at pi, and then we're going to drop three units, one, two, three. So it's going to put me right here at negative two, and then I'm going to come back to that midline, and the curve would look like this, and that would give me the domains from zero to two pi. So with that sine curve, you're always going to start right on that midline right here. You're going to go up, come back to the midline, you're going to drop down to your min and come back to that midline. So it's all about knowing where that midline is and, and recentering yourself. I actually find this type of question more enjoyable where they've given me the graph and i got to try to write the equation. And so it looks like, um, so I first said to myself, it looks like the maximum height is going to be three units. The minimum height is going to be one unit. What's the average of three and one? Well, the average is two, so you know your midline is at two. I'll abbreviate that there. And what you'll notice is that this graph starts right at two. So that so you know right away it's got to be a sine curve because that it starts on that midline. Now, how big's the amplitude? How high up did you go? Well, you only went one unit up. Now, the last question is the hard one. Maybe. Maybe you won't think so. I want to know the frequency. So I'm going to trace the graph here. Starting at zero. Okay, I'm tracing. Okay, that's half a cycle. There's one complete cycle. Here's one and a half cycles. There's two complete cycles. Okay, there's two and a half. And there's three cycles right at 2 pi. So if you see three cycles right at 2 pi, that's telling us our frequency is a 3. And we could say y equals sine of, we've got a frequency of 3, okay? And I've got a midline of 2. If you want to put a 1 here, you can, but that would be unnecessary. Okay, now we're going to try to take a cosine equation and graph this. And uh, what I didn't mention earlier is that when, you come to, when it comes time to graph, you could always plug these equations into your calculator as a way of kind of getting a rough idea of what it should look like, and it's just a matter of getting it onto your paper. But what if I do this again? I'm going to, just because of my limited amount of space, I'm only going to count by twos here. If I try to count by three or four blocks, I run out of room. So we've got our pi over two. Trouble squeezing it in there. We've got pi. We've got 3 pi over 2, and then we've got our 2 pi, okay? Now what you'll notice here is um, uh, we've got an amplitude of 2, a frequency of 2, and if my frequency is a 2, and the period is going to be 2 pi divided by that frequency, the period's pi, okay? So I'm going to finish my first cycle at pi, and we'll finish our second cycle at 2 pi. The good news is, is we really don't have a vertical shift to worry about. You know, it's technically plus zero, so I don't have to worry about shifting it up or down. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to start two units above the midline. I'm going to finish two units above the midline. So this is where the cosine starts. This is where it finishes. Halfway between the start and the finish is, is going to be its minimum value. 
okay? And halfway between that first value and that minimum value is going to be my first root. And I'm going to have another root right here. And then I just got to work on my curvature. It's going to be tough in this small space. So we got a nice little curve, flowing curve there. And then I'm just going to kind of repeat that process. I got a root and a min and a root and a max. I'm just going to kind of get this graph squeezed in here. All right, not my worst drawing ever, uh, but uh, certainly in that small, tiny space, that's probably about the best I'm going to be able to do. All right, now we're going to take a look at this graph and write an equation. I see a maximum height of 3 units and a minimum height of 3 units. The average of positive 3 and negative 3 is 0, so we got a, um, we've got a midline right here on the axis, so no vertical shift to worry about, which is great. The curve starts way up above that uh, midline, so we know it's going to be a cosine curve with an amplitude of positive 3 here. How many curves do we draw? Let's see. Okay, there's half a cosine. There's one full cosine. There's one and a half. And there's two full cosines. So let's see if we can put this all together. I think my amplitude is going to be a 3. My frequency is going to be a 2. And my midline technically would be 0. And how about this? Maybe this will help. You're thinking general form. A cosine parenthesis bx or b theta plus c that would be y equals 3 times the cosine of 2x and there's your equation and you can always graph this equation on your calculator to see if it looks like this rascal right here alright our last one of the night has become my favorite type um, we're going to try to write the equation given this amplitude has to equal 4 and the period has to equal 6 pi. Now, what you'll remember here, and, and they want it to be a sine curve, so I'm thinking the general form of a sine curve is A times the sine of BX plus C. Now, they didn't mention anything about a vertical shift or a midline, so I'm going to assume that that's a 0. Um, and the amplitude could go right here. The question is, the letter B represents the frequency, and they did not give me the frequency directly, but I can use the period to kind of work backwards and solve for the frequency. So here's what I'm thinking. My formula says period equals 2 pi divided by F. And I know that the period is 6 pi, so substitute that for P. From here, I'm going to cross multiply. I'm running out of room here. All right, so cross multiply, I'll get 6 times pi times f equals 2 pi. I'm going to divide both sides by pi, they cancel, and then divide both sides by 6, and 2 divided by 6 makes 1 third. So that's the frequency that I'm going to plug in right there. So my final answer looks like y equals 4. Technically, you could put negative 4 in there because if you wrote negative 4 right here, the amplitude would still be considered positive 4 because you're taking the absolute value of it. And I'm going one third x, and you could put plus zero, but that's not necessary. And there's my final answer. All right, so I hope you picked up something tonight that's going to get you a little bit closer to your dream goal on that Regents exam, and we'll catch you tomorrow.